to the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint Show. I am your host, Jay Jones. Black Entrepreneur Blueprint was created specifically to educate and inspire black entrepreneurs to launch, build, and grow successful businesses. Join us as we help build an economic power base in the black community by promoting business ownership. If you are currently an entrepreneur or want to be an entrepreneur, We invite you to join us every week here at Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, episode number 330. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and today we have another outstanding and informative show in store for you. Today, we're going to be talking with the co-founder of Hella Cocktail, Mr. Jomari Pinkert. We're going to talk about how Jomari and his friends started making drinks and creating mixes, which turned into a seven-figure-plus business called Hella Cocktail. Now, before we get to today's episode, I just want to share a few things with the BEB family. First and foremost, I want to welcome all first-time listeners to Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Welcome to the BEB family. Please stick around until the end of today's broadcast, and I'm going to share all my social media contact information and my free resource links, such as the link to my new book, A New Black Wall Street, Circulating the Black Dollar Worldwide by Building Successful E-Commerce Businesses. Also, two platforms I've created to help stimulate and circulate black dollars in the worldwide black economy, BeSmartByBlack.com and HireBlackFreelancers.com. Also, don't forget the new rebranded, rebooted Black Entrepreneur Blueprint Academy is open with new courses and new information inside. So you can go to BEBacademy.com, get your five-day trial. You can play around in the academy, take any of the courses or trainings, and make sure you check out some of the new uh, stuff we put in. How to use quizzes to sell your product or service, how to build a successful YouTube channel tutorial, and LinkedIn success, how to leverage LinkedIn to get more sales. Go to BEBacademy.com, enroll, and you will get five days free to take anything behind the curtain in the BEB Academy. Also, don't forget my new pod course. It's an audio course titled The Blueprint. I've partnered up with Himalaya Learning. You can go to HimalayaLearning.com forward slash blueprint and use the code blueprint and get 14 days free trial on the learning platform. And you can take that pod course and courses by Seth Golden, Tim Ferriss, and everybody else on the platform. Now, let's get ready for today's episode with Mr. Jamari Pinkert, the co-founder of Hella Cocktail. Family, we are live with Mr. Jamari Pinkert, the founder of Hella Cocktail. How are you this morning, brother? I'm excellent, my friend. Thanks for having me. How are you? Uh, I'm good, man. I'm good. Rocking and rolling, brother. Um, it's funny, BEB family, I know a lot of you guys listen to the podcast, but you can also check out this uh, on YouTube because we're doing a live interview. And I'm sitting here looking at Jamari, and nice. behind him, he has a stash house of all of these products, and we want to get into that <laughs> as we move forward in the interview. So, uh, Jamari, for the folks that don't know who you are, just give me a little background about you personally, and then we're going to move into your entrepreneurial journey. Sure, sure. I'm uh, Jamari Pinkard, native New Yorker. Um, wow, the journey is long. Um, <laughs> grew up in Queens, New York. Uh, uh, did the high school thing in the public school sector, then went on to uh, the University of Virginia to acquire my business degree, and then did my MBA at uh, University of Pennsylvania, the Warren School of Business. Along the way, I had some corporate you know, maneuvering um, in corporate America, and then found my way into the entrepreneurial uh, space vis-a-vis the Hella Cocktail Company. All right. So tell us what Hella Cocktail is. So a, a, a lot of times people may get the impression that it's alcohol, but go ahead and tell us what Hella Cocktail is. For sure, for sure. We are a company that creates and manufactures and markets um, a, a bunch of non-alcoholic products. So all the accoutrement behind the bar, that's not the spirit. So gotcha. think about your bitters, think about your Bloody Mary mix, your margarita mix. And the newest addition to our family and the newest innovation is a product called Bitters and Soda. 
um, that we that we're bringing to market. So we're super excited. We've been around for almost a decade now. Um, you can find us in you know, you know most of your retail stores behind any bar restaurant in the country. Um, on some airlines, some hotels. Uh, so you know we're excited about continuing our journey um, and and discussing all that today. Cool. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the name. I always I'm curious about how people come up with the names for their business. Where did the helicopter name come up? Great how question. Did... Good question. <laughs> so so the, the 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 old story and the true story is that when we started the company, it was never meant to be a company. It was completely a hobby. And um, some buddies and I uh, were the kind of guys that like you know watched the game, made a homemade pizza, and tried to one up each other making a cocktail. Right. Um, and some of the fellas came from the Bay. Um, and if you know anything about the Bay, hella means like intensely. It means like, you know, you would say something hella delicious. You know, in New York, we would say something mad delicious. Right. And so hella, they brought hella uh, to the East Coast and it kind of stuck. And yeah. so when the hobby of making bitters, um, you know, came to be, we were like, how do you describe it? And it was like, oh, it's hella bitter, right? It's very, very bitter. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of stuck and like, you know, it, it was such a great name that it grabbed onto the rest of the products. Okay, so, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it just means <laughs> intensely. And it's definitely Bay Area, Bay Area slang uh, okay. that we borrowed and brought to the East Coast. And now you can find us everywhere. So hopefully everyone feels it out. So, so you mean you didn't have a big focus group, man, when you came up with your name? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Man, not at all. This was one of those, uh, you know, <laughs> hobbies that you, you hope you're proven concept and you were not trying to really do it. And, right. and all of us, you know, you create that snowball effect and that avalanche starts to happen and you say well we got something we're not changing the name now um, exactly so. it's, it's funny because I, I tell a lot of my coaching students the name is what you make of it you know so you have to position and brand your your name and once again most people didn't even know what nike was when they came out they didn't know it was a, a god uh, what was a god or a goddess i can't mm -hmm, even remember mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it they were like nike what's that but based on how they positioned it then you now know, just do it. Nike, sports, performance, athletic wear, and all types of stuff. Um, I wanted to ask you too, man, um, in terms of starting this type of business, why didn't you, or are you even looking to go into the alcohol space? If so, why? If not, why? Great question. Uh, it's something we've been, we, we over here in Hella have been thinking about for a very long time. Um, you know, the first thing you have to know about the alcohol business when you're talking about the, the, the true alcohol spirit business is that it's very expensive to kind of get started and to sustain. Um, you have to have a distiller's license, meaning you most likely need a distillery um, right. if you're going to really make it handcrafted the way that we make our products. And so mm -hmm. for us, when we, you know, as, we, as we've been on the journey, we, we you know, the, the expense, the legalities behind it, as well as like we're not experts in making alcohol. Right. right. Like, like sometimes you need to stay in the lane of the things you're really good at um, mm -hmm. and what, and understand what your value proposition is to the customers that are trusting you to make certain things. Um, so instead of, you know, thinking about alcohol and going in that and that tangent, we actually made a bitters and soda, which is a non-alcoholic sparkling aperitif that we did do focus groups for. And our customers that do buy the rest of our products were like, you definitely have the credibility to make that product. Right. And so for us, it was like, not only what do we want to make and what we are we experts at making, but what is our audience and our customers think that we should make and what, what are we allowed to make in their view? And, and so the non-alcoholic space is exactly where, where we need to stay and where we chose, where we've chosen to continue to be. Okay. So tell me about the time as we get ready to move into your entrepreneurial journey. Tell me when this hobby the light bulb went off and you guys started thinking about making it a real business. What was that conversation or that interaction like? Yeah, no. Uh, so, so, so we were doing a Kickstarter um, back in the day and that was like, uh, you know, a pre-sale to sell bitters to, to, to hobbyists and, and family and friends. Um, and, you know, I think we over, I think we tried to raise $800 and raise like $2,300. Okay. Again, not a company, just a hobby. Right. <laughs> and the light bulb went off to say, okay, there's a bunch of people around the country that are that know what this is. Right? They know what it is, and it's kind of cool. Right. At the same time, the cocktail kind of renaissance was happening where people cared about craft cocktail bars and things like that. And so the light bulb was on around 2011, 2012, but we didn't really get serious until 2014 because we all had other jobs, and we were all really still trying to 
prove the concept. You know, it, if you think about the market opportunity for something like what we're doing, what we've done in the past, it was relatively small compared to like your Ubers of the world. So it wasn't big business. It's still a small business. And so the light bulb came on when we got some big orders um, from some, some kind of namely re retail chains that were like, oh, can we pair this, what you're making with our bar accoutrement, our glassware, things like that. And we're like, okay, this, is, this can work. This can work if we associate ourselves at a higher brand and luxury premium level. We can, yeah. we can turn on something here that makes a lot of sense for a lot of home consumers. So um, associating with a higher brands or, or premium brands, uh, in terms of your pricing for your products, where do you fall in that spectrum? Are you a higher end or premium? We are at the higher end and we're at the higher end for a number of reasons. Um, okay. We're at the higher end because we don't cut corners on making our products and the process that we, that we kind of incorporate. And so, you know, w when you're making things like alcohol or things like bitters or things like, you know, uh, certain kinds of mixes, you know, you, there's a lot of companies that, that cut corners to make things faster. Right. Um, and we don't do that. We use whole spices, whole ingredients in our products. And so, that warrants a higher price point. It's not about, it's not, some of it's about branding and, and the willingness to pay, but most, most of it's about the ingredients we use and making sure that they're always paramount and consistent and that just costs more. Nah, that makes a lot of sense, man. Um, in terms of financing, the, the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint family, we always like to figure out, because one of the biggest deterrents for starting businesses a lot of times, uh, unfortunately in, in our community is financing. So I know you guys started on a hobby. Everybody was working and had a job. So did you bootstrap when you started in addition to the Kickstarter or how did you create your finance for you? Yeah, no, no, it, it was, it was completely bootstrapped. Uh, we, we used okay. about, I want to say $2,500 and some credit cards. Okay. <laughs> um, and that was, you know what I mean? Like the old school, like this is how you, you hope that it works. But what we did and what we were able to do when we were bootstrapping was because we all had jobs, we didn't have to pull salaries. And so, you know, we didn't just jump in, right? Because that wasn't possible. So for us, we all had our full-time jobs and this is what we would do on Tuesday nights and the weekends and we call the project nights and weekends, right? And so we were able to take every dollar that we profited on the, on the initial batches of product and reinvest it into making more product for, for two years, right? And so that allowed us to like gather some steam you know, create some economics so we can be a little bit more sustainable than your kind of like traditional startup that's looking to like power through. Because we had other jobs, we weren't like, this is going to, if this doesn't work, the world is over. And so wow. we were able to, again, take those, take those credit cards and that, 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 that a tiny bit of money and then recycle it back into the business over and over again. Uh, I want the light bulb to go off for the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint family members right here. So Jamari says something that's very important. Um, in terms of partnerships, your partnerships, they, your partners need to be equally yoked. So for example, if Jamari's partners needed money every time they made a profit, then they wouldn't be able to pour back into the business. So partnerships, make sure that everybody is equally yoked and understands that, hey, we're going to go, if this is what you're going to do, we're going to funnel all our money back into the business so we can grow the business as opposed to uh, I've been in some partnerships and if you make a dollar, people are ready to take out 85 cents. And I'm like, you can't, <laughs> can't really can't grow do that. Right. You can't do that. So, yeah, so how many right partners do you have in the business? There are three of us. There are really? three of us, myself, Eddie and Tobin. Okay. And so we were all connected and we were, we've been friends for an aggregate of probably 30 some odd years. So we've known each other in different facets of life before this. Gotcha. And so we were all on the same page when to your point about, you know, someone wants to take out 85 cents on the dollar. <laughs> we right. all knew like, this is the process that we have to kind of entertain if we want this to have some sustainability behind it and actually turn it into something that, that can make sense long-term. I, I want to stay on the uh, subject of, of partnerships uh, real quick before we move on. Um, how did you guys, figure out the individual roles? Because I know a lot of times there's issues you don't want to overlap in what you do. How did you determine the individual roles of each partner? And are all the partners active partners or are some more silent than others? Or how's that work? No, great. All great questions. Um, all of our partners are active. So okay. we're all in. We all are now, um, you know, pay, getting paid salaries from the company. We're in full time, 100%. This is our day-to-day full-time job. Gotcha. Um, uh, the, the first question was, how do we find our roles, right? And, right. and it, 
you know, this, this it, it doesn't happen often, but for us, um, we were in a unique position where we all have different skill sets that we organically had and were, you know, schooled in or, or kind of like came to. Mm -hmm. And those allowed us to kind of like parcel out the roles pretty easily, even though there's a tiny bit of overlap everywhere, which is kind of because you need right. some checks and balances to make sure you guys are all on the same page. Mm -hmm. But our natural dispositions happen to be, you know, um, Tobin's like a maker. He grew up on a farm. He loves to be in the kitchen. So he is a, what we call the chief liquid officer and responsible for what's in the bottle, right? But he also enjoys that process. Right. So it made sense, even though we all know how to make the products, mm -hmm. he really leads the R&D on new flavors. He really leads the procurement of the ingredients because it's a space that felt natural for him, right? So okay. um, for Eddie, you know, we used to call him mission control and he was always in the tech web, you know, design space. So for him, the packaging and design of what the company looks and feels like was just his wheelhouse. Right. And so when we started to figure out what the lanes were, it was like, well, you enjoy this lane and you're good at it, like own it, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, or be the liaison between ourselves and a, a branding agency or whatever the, whatever, the, whatever the workload is. And then for myself, I came from the finance and strategy world. So that was like, okay, manage the economics, figure out the strategy, how do we go to market? You know, how we talk to different partnerships because that was kind of my wheelhouse before. So again, okay. while we can all maneuver through each other's wheelhouses, um, to an extent, kind of we naturally fit. And those are, that doesn't always happen. Right. Um, and so when you're looking for more people, you want to fill in the gaps of like, you have to know what, you know, what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are so you can fill in those holes um, when you're building your team. So in terms of sales, are you in charge of the sales or do all of you take part in that or are you the main driver for the sales? Yeah, I lead the sales team and then we have a sales team underneath, but oh. that, that reports up to me. Um, so I would lead kind of biz dev and that whole structure of how we go about approaching each type of consumer. All right. So what does your structure, uh, company structure look like in terms of number of employees and um, the functions? So, so basically your, your yeah. chart almost. Yeah, no, we go from, we, so, so we go from six to about, probably six to about 20 people, depending on the season. Okay. Um, because we have like, you know, holidays and things like that. We can ratchet up because we have, we start to activate like, um, live marketplaces, right? Like yeah. pop-up shops. Um, and so we have, you know, uh, more people during the holidays. We've also had over the life cycle of the company, we've also had brand ambassadors um, and salespeople that worked in different states that attack each market. So we go back and forth on, on, on that. The core group right now is six people. Um, the majority of us handle sales, biz dev, and then we actually have a lot of outsourced talent to help liaison in terms of like raw materials, the warehousing, the manufacturing. So we lead teams, but they're not connected to us directly, meaning we don't pay them on payroll. We yeah. pay them as 1099 outsource for a lot of other work. So mm -hmm. I'd say, you know, the, the team can range from six to 50. We always have a team that's, you know, a warehouse that's doing work right now. That's an outsource warehouse, but we pay them, you know, pack and ship, what's called, what's called pack and, um, pack and pull or pack and yeah. ship. Um, and so we have, you know, again, we, we're, we have so many pieces of the puzzle that are all locked in um, that we range in terms of how many people we employ, but all the roles are, are satisfied. Okay. Now um, you mentioned something and with Q4 getting ready to come up, you know, a lot of my, my BEB family members are in the e-commerce and you just talked about like pick packing and shipping, which is basically logistics. So in terms of logistics, do you have your own warehouses or do you use third party legit three PLs, third party logistics company to help ship your products out? Great question. We, we used to have everything in the house. So when we built the company, we built everything in house. Mm -hmm. As we got bigger, we realized that we couldn't manually do everything, especially in New York city where the rent is super high. Right. So what we did is start to branch out and find three PLs, third, third party manufacturers and third party um, fulfillment centers in different States that can help us do that work. Okay. So as of now, we have three fulfillment centers and two uh, fulfillment distribution centers. Okay. So, you know, depending on the product, depending on the type of order that's being asked for, a different organizational piece will fulfill that order or make the, make the product itself. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it's funny, uh, I want the BEB family uh, to recognize this isn't something that happened overnight, guys. This is from years of experience, trial, error and things of that nature. So when you, listen to, when you listen to these 
serious entrepreneurs that come on the platform don't get it twisted everybody has to start from concept and then build from there um so it's it's possible for anybody um uh, as a newer brand, and like i said and like i said we built it in in-house first right so we were literally making all the product up front when we first started the company for the first few years not months not days years mm. um and we were shipping and packing boxes which sometimes we still do if we send out something that's rush emergency hence all the stuff back here right mm. We yep. still have, you know, if I if I pan my camera over here, we still have like a little fulfillment center going on with boxes and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I showed you out here, you'd see like a whole bunch of other stuff that's like, wait a minute, do you guys ship from out of here? <laughs> but, but we can turn it on if we needed to, you know, very small, you know, small, small pieces. But yeah, we did it in house. And so we, the important piece of doing everything in house when you start a company, whatever it is, is that you know how, how much everything costs if you're going to hire people to do it or right. you're going to outsource it. You know how much each piece of your labor system costs to down to the penny. So you know how much it should cost, right? And so it's super valuable to know the entire um, kind of ecosystem of how much you pay and how much you need to make a profit on, on the things you make. Nah, great, that's a great point. And what type of, of margins do you uh, reach for, for you guys to be profitable on your, or I know it's gonna differ based on the product, but what do you, what do you, what's your goal in terms of profit? Yeah. Margin? My, my mentors always taught me that, you know, you, if you make a product, you need to, especially in food and beverage and every industry is different. Right. But in the food and beverage industry, you need to have a, a, a gross margin, meaning the margin on the actual product mm -hmm. of at least 50%. Now, gotcha. now why is that important? It's important because, you know, after the other 50% is for overhead for people right. for marketing. Right. And so, mm -hmm. After all those, you still need some baseline to be able to take something home. Right. So, or to reinvest into the, into the business for next year or next quarter or whatever it is. So when we think about making products, it has to have at least a 50% margin before we create it at all. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Do you include shipping in that margin too? No, that's just, that's just the actual okay. product itself. Everything gotcha. else, because when you start scaling shipping, when you start scaling labeling, when you start scaling any of that overhead that happens, it yeah. gets cheaper as you, as you have more of it. Right. So the product doesn't though, right? The product, the unit the cost same. of the product is always the same mm -hmm. um, at scale, right? Yes, right. of course, when you start the company, it's going to be more expensive to make, but at scale, um, and a lot of our products are at scale, we're at the highest level. So you have to have that baked in at a 50% gross margin, meaning on the actual product itself. So when, when you're talking about um, your, your product is a fixed, uh, now does, do spices, the difference uh, in terms of the, the variation in the cost of spices. And the reason I'm asking this is um, one of my buddies had looked at a, a Little Caesars pizza franchise years ago. And what something that what amazed me was he said the most expensive ingredient for the pizza is actually the cheese. Mm. And the price of cheese is going to vary Hopefully. based on supply and demand. So does supply and demand in terms of your ingredients, does that affect your pricing or is pretty for your products or is it pretty stable? Yeah, I, I think I think you have to think about what we make, right? A lot of things we make are basically using spices, right? To your point. Right. And spices are probably the oldest trade yep. that we know as, in the modern world. Mm -hmm. And so the, the the prices of spices are usually within, vol they, 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 their volatility is really small. Gotcha. You can always bank, you know, where it's gonna, where it's gonna fall with, within a few pennies. So mm -hmm. unless something happens that we can't, that we haven't seen in almost a decade, Right. Which is always happen can be possible, right? <laughs> Which always, right. anything is possible. We, we're living in a time right now. <laughs> exactly. So never count all the eggs, right? Right. <laughs> um, but but yeah, the spice, the, the because spices are so kind of you know, they're so um abundant. <clears throat> right. Um, the price for that is is, is pretty pretty stable. Mm -hmm. I'd say something like oranges might change. Like the fruit we use, the price of those might change a little bit, have a little bit more volatility, but not enough to not enough to change the the margin based by a lot. Okay. Now, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and nothing crazy happen. <laughs> right. There'll be a shortage on all just coming up. <laughs> so, um, when you're developing or creating this, this new brand, how do you get or, or make noise to be able to, to be profitable in this type of market and coming in as newbies and how were you able to market your product to get it to where it is right now when you first started? Tell me what that looked like 
uh, your marketing strategy at the, at the beginning? Yeah, no, the, the marketing strategy was, was very, very simple. And I think we keep it that simple even today, even though there are more like widgets connected to it. Um, our kind of like the way we think about it is literally always to try to figure out where to meet your consumer where they are. Meaning right. what are the behaviors that your consumer goes through on a day-to-day -day basis um, that are related to or unrelated to having a cocktail and gotcha. meet them at the place where they are. Don't try to like bring them to you, right? Cause that never gotcha. works. But if you can intercept people through their natural behavior, then you can at least be, make them aware that you exist, right? Which is like step one. Like if you have a ladder of like uh, making a sale, the first one is, is awareness. Right. The second one is association. And third one is building that relationship. Right. So for us, it's always about creating the awareness once we create the awareness, we want that association. So the association looks like, where are you sold? What kind of store are you sold in? What do you right. place next to? Who else uses your product, mm -hmm. right? Where can you find it at a bar or restaurant? So that's the association. So yeah. awareness for us was like meeting the consumer where they are, which meant simple things like, uh, it's Friday afternoon or Friday early evening, four o'clock, um, and you know that it's Labor Day weekend coming up. So we're going to actually put ourselves in the middle of a whole food store and we're going to do an in-store demonstration tasting where we're going to taste you on the product because yeah. why you're in the mindset of, I'm about to celebrate this moment and occasion. I'm looking for things that are in this space and someone happens to be here. That's going to tell me about their brand, why it's good and let me taste it. Right. And so they may purchase, they may not, but the simple fact that you're letting them be aware that you exist is a moment in time that's going to be captured for now and or later. And right. so we do that over and over and over and over again, you become, you know, what people really want is to be in others' consideration sets, nah. right? You want to be able to walk down the aisle and know there are Oreos on my left probably, there's Chips Ahoy over there, right? Mm -hmm. You might not buy it, but you know when you're walking down the aisle what right. is there. And mm -hmm. so that's what you're trying to capture is making people aware that you're there. Right. Um, and that's like step one. And so that's the way, that's the way we did it. Literally boost to the ground, you know, in the stores, talking to customers, letting them know that this product existed and here's why it was important to their culinary or bartending, you know, like crusades, right? Mm -hmm. um, we taught them step one. If you think about the definition of a cocktail, it has four ingredients. Okay. Um, the spirit, water, which is usually ice, sugar, and bitters. And so just people, just lending people education in, in terms of like what a cocktail is, gives them insight, awareness, and association to your brand right so they're a simple it was again always very simple and not too complex and we kind of do the same thing today in different ways depending on the tools that are available to us now that's a, that's a great that's a great uh great answer and great response to that another light bulb goes off beb family i talk about this all the time a lot of times you don't have to create the traffic you just have to get in front of the traffic and that's basically what you're saying you get in front of the traffic that are people that are uh, predisposed to purchase your product and or service as opposed to trying to create all the traffic. So uh, that's, that's definitely a good point, man. In terms of that marketing strategy, I assume you use mostly brand ambassadors or were you guys out there yourself? Uh, no, we, we were out there in the streets ourselves. We went, we, like remember I said, we didn't have any, any, <laughs> any, any extra dollars to pay anybody, not even right. ourselves. So the last thing we're going to do is pay other people, that right. didn't were, were not experts and did not have the passion and the hustle and right. the drive to get out there and explain the same, you know, the same uh, uh, elevator pitch a, a hundred times a day. Right. And so again, like I said, for years we did everything from making the product, shipping the product, going to stores and telling people about the product, uh, mm -hmm. taking the orders. Right. So convincing different little mom and pop stores to buy and put it on their shelf. Right. So no, we, 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 we did it. Uh, all the way through and you know super important super valuable lesson because you start to understand what the consumer's feedback is and then you can make your tweaks on any part of the system right like oh i didn't they hated the way it came in a package when we shipped it great now i know that we hated the way it tasted with lemonade great now i know that right oh we love this and we love that so the things that the people do love you know okay these are the things that accentuate right, right? accentuate this accentuate that um and so that's actually how the bitters and soda came to be. You know, we would taste people out on a bottle of cocktail bitters, which for those who if you don't know, mm -hmm. is a flavorful infusion of um, spices, root and uh, fruit and bitter root. 
And so it's an extract and, you know, let me see if I have one right here. Okay. It's yeah. kind of like a, a bottle of one and we would taste people out in like apple juice or lemonade or soda water, which is mm -hmm. the most commonly way to taste someone who does not familiar. And they would say, do you just make the, that other thing? Right. <laughs> make that. Right. And so, and so, you know, now we do. Gotcha. Gotcha. But again, that's an insight from the consumers that told us, can you make the other thing, right? Please make the other thing as well. And so we added that to the repertoire. And so being inside the store, doing the marketing yourself gives you all that insight. So we gotcha. absolutely bootstrapped it and did it ourselves. See, that's, that's great feedback, man. It, you dropping some gems over here today, bro. This is something else I always talk about. If you don't put your product or service out there, you'll never get any feedback. The consumer will let you know what they want. And then it's your job to, to fill that gap. And so by being out there, using the feedback from your customers, now you were able to fill another gap that you didn't even know people wanted from you at first until you got out there and started mixing around, man. So, uh, man, you're dropping a lot of gems, bro. I'm telling yeah, you, I appreciate that's, that's, that. That's, that's what I want to do. That's my job. <laughs> that's what you do, right? <laughs> that's my job. All right, I wanted to ask you now about your two, I guess you can call them almost different verticals because you have a directed consumer, um, I presume, and also mm -hmm. two industry, two uh, bars, uh, retailers, so more of your wholesale business. How did you start off? Was it all direct-to-consumer at first or was it a combination of, uh, you know, wholesale to uh, bars and, um, and, and, you know, food stores? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I, I think because because we started online with a Kickstarter, right? If you if you take it back, which is you, the first thing we learned before anything else was how to ship to consumers. Gotcha. Because if people were ordering online, we were like, wait a minute, okay, so now we have to figure out how to ship a product that's ready made. Right. And so while it's a very small part of our business still, kind of D to C, mm -hmm. uh, we figured it out first. Right. Uh, which helped us along the journey because it's picked up so much steam over the the last few years as like your Amazons and your, you know, your, your Shopify's have become real big business. Um, uh, but yeah, our retail footprint and our, and our bar restaurant wholesale, we call it hospitality footprint is much larger than the, than the DTC because there are so many more uh, bars and restaurants who need the product on an ongoing basis because right. they're serving same, so many more customers per day. Mm -hmm. um, what was the rest of that question? Just so I make sure uh -huh. I answer it. In terms of, uh, man, we've been, you, I was wrapped up in your answer. No, I was I'm, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was just, like, wait a minute, before I just dive in, let me make sure that I get the answer right. No, I was just asking, how did you determine, or it, are there different approaches, I guess, to obviously gotcha. the D to C yeah. versus the, you know. Absolutely, 100%. You know. They're, they're, they're actually like two different businesses or three different businesses because the, the systems in which you kind of like get to retail or get to bar, restaurant, and get to consumer, directly or like they're literally three different worlds you could actually have a company for each one right um the way that retail works um is very interesting and it's really hard um there are lots of gatekeepers at retailers and they're the buyers to the stores okay it's really hard to get to a buyer at a store to say hey can you take my product on can you taste it right mind you even putting it on the shelf right. and so we learned early on that there were like lots of what you call trade shows there's things like the Fancy Food Show, Expo West, National, National Restaurant Association. They're all shows that are in different cities across the country where you can set up shop, set up basically a booth, a uh, tasting table, and taste out this community of retailers on your products. Now, during COVID, all these have turned to virtual, which I don't know how it's going to pan out right. um, because you can't see anyone. No one can taste anything. So it's kind of like a difficult moment in time if you're a new startup brand. Um but traditionally, you would go to these shows and showcase your product. And that's how the community would understand that this thing exists. Is it trending? Is it cool? Do you have new flavors? Like what's happening in your space that's specific to that category of the retail store? Okay. Um, when you think about bars and restaurants, it's a whole different system. That's like, do you have distributors that go to bars and restaurants and actually deliver, you know, right. olives and cherries and you know, all the other stuff you might see at a bar that, that gets delivered there. And so that's a whole different pipeline of figuring out um, how to link up with distributors that can actually deliver your product and how do you get to that market and sell product there. 
Um, and then the, you know, direct to consumers, like, you know, what's your online strategy? How are you talking to and how are you gaining traffic towards someone who may care about, you know, um, your product, but doesn't live in your city, doesn't have not hasn't heard of your brand, doesn't go to the bar restaurant your product's in and doesn't have, go to the grocery store right. that you're in. It's a whole different animal. Um, and so again, you have to figure out how to meet each one of those, each one of those stakeholders where they are too, right? right? Not only your end consumer, but the other stakeholders, how do I get to them? Yeah. All right. That, that makes a lot of sense, man. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you have variations of your products based on the different vertical that you're in? So for example, I know a lot of people don't may not know, like when you sell like at these dollar stores, a lot of times <clears> their <throat> sizes are different. They're usually smaller than the standard sizes. Uh, you go to Costco and then BJ's, their sizes are larger. So yep, do you yep, have yep. <laughs> variations Question. for different we vertical? Do. We do. I'm looking behind me, so bear with me. I'm trying to find yeah. if there was something on the shelf. It might not be, but this is an example of something that we make in a smaller size packaging Okay. than this big bottle. Right? Yeah. And it's not because it's going to um, the dollar store, but it is because it might go to like a hotel or an airplane. Gotcha. So we make basically like a single serving version of products so they can get into different fit in different places okay. mainly hospitality airplanes and hotels and like in smaller cocktail kits that people are like gifting us a kit of something especially right now during covid you know restaurants are, are doing the the the, the curbside pickup right. and you might get like a pasta meal and still order an old-fashioned and so we mm -hmm. serve them with a tiny one ounce bottle single serving and you can do that with your bourbon all of a sudden you have a drink to make so we do make a few things in those packaging sizes for specific occasions and specific clientele, yes. Um, we are not at the place yet, and hopefully very soon, where we do make a bundle pack for okay. your Costco's or Sam Clubs, which I don't think the sizes would change. I think that we just have more um, things bound into the same package. Gotcha. Yeah, I, uh, it's funny, like my razors, so I was in BJ's the other day, and you know how expensive razors are, right? Um, so my wife says, uh, yeah, go pick up, uh, there's like a 30 pack of Mach 3. Uh, <laughs> it's like $200. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically it was like, uh, like $40 and I'm like, damn, I said, but you know what? I might as well just go ahead and get it because in the long run, it's going to save me money, <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of your retail exposure, what do you think is your biggest, or who do you think is your biggest customer in terms of, uh, your retail distribution? Uh, right now, it's probably, I said it was two of them that are our biggest because they cover the whole country. Mm -hmm. um, there's a liquor chain called Total Wine and More. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is in really? most states. Um, they carry all of uh, the hella products. So you can find anything that's, in, that's on our kind of website or anything product we carry in there. Um, and then our second biggest customer is Whole Foods across the country. Gotcha. They, carry the, uh, they carry the bitters and sodas. Okay. Yeah. Uh, total wine is funny, man. I got a, uh, one, not too far. I know there's one in Delaware. Um, but people don't realize I used to be in, a, a, in advertising and, um, they actually were one of my clients and even mm. I didn't realize how big they were until I started, you know, uh, working with them. It was crazy, yeah. man. Yeah, everywhere. I think I have yeah. like 200, 200 some odd locations across the country. Crazy. Pretty big. Crazy. Um, I wanted to ask you in terms of, your um, successes and any setbacks that you have. So a lot of times, you know, most people don't start a business and all of a sudden it goes from zero to a hundred and everything is lovely. Tell mm -hmm. us about a time that you guys had a setback. Um, how did you get over it? If you did, and what did you learn from it? What, give us your biggest setback. Yeah, good question. Our, our biggest setback for me personally, like when I think about it, is a bunch of that happened in the company, right? Mm -hmm. um, for us, it was like uh, we have uh, uh, kind of brand, brand ambassador slash sales development program that we were like building. Mm -hmm. And um, while we were building it and, you know, hiring people from all across the country to help work for us to do, you know, the in-store tasting that we talked about, to actually right. do the sales and distribution with our distributors in different states. And I think we got up to 15 or 16 people, which we were, which was, which felt amazing, right? It was like, you have all these people, you're building a system, mm -hmm. um, you're building this team and like everyone's going home about it. And we were trying to, you know, we were trying to do that simultaneously by, and 
at the same time get one or two big clientele across the country that helped us pay for the services that we were hiring people for. Mm -hmm. And we missed the boat by like six months, meaning wow. we couldn't keep the people on board on payroll because we didn't get these two accounts. Gotcha. And so we had to let, you know, 10 or so people go in that time period. Mm -hmm. um, and that was tough. It was really tough because, you know, you great people doing great work, but right. you're not, you're not, we're not having enough steam to keep them. Right. And so it was a really, really tough transition for me, like to think about like, damn, I love having this team, especially under the vertical of sales, which is my vertical, right? right. Which is like, um, and so it was tough to like, it was tough to part, to part with that. You know, the, the, what I hope is that, you know, we can rebuild that, that space. COVID kind of destroyed a lot of that. Why well, it double backed us because, you know, now we can't even, now, now we have the accounts. Right. But we can't go into the store. We can't go to accounts. We can't do the things that. So it's kind of like a double whammy, uh, right? When we, you know, we, we kind of like, let's call it, we failed in that spot and then right. we won and then we're going to go back and then we can't. <laughs> and so that's, uh, you know, it hurts. It, it hurts. It hurts again yeah. not to be able to bring that, bring that, that part of the company back. Yeah. um at, at the moment so yeah that was a, that was a big one yeah. how how were those conversations man to your to your employees you know what i don't think you know because 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 we silo some of the some of the sales from um the hr of the company mm -hmm. i don't think I, I they weren't great you know they they're not great because they're they're, they're not first we thought oh we're gonna furlough right. and then furlough turned into you know into mm -hmm. we can't bring you back so the long-winded nature of the ambiguity of those conversations uh, can never feel good, right? And so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, I, those are those are tough ones to swallow. Yeah, when I had uh, uh, my mortgage business, uh, and I lost that during the crash. So we had like fifty. I had two partners and like fifty plus employees. And so once that oh eight came in, man, we weren't able to get any loans closed. And one of the the, the hardest things to do because. Uh, you build a family, basically, you know, you work, your coworkers, we're all on the same mission. We all have the same vision. They're doing great work, but it got to the point where it, this uh, finance, you know, was so tight, we couldn't get any loans closed. So we had to pretty much let most of the employees go. And we mm -hmm. spent hundreds of thousands of dollars out of our own pocket, trying to keep this baby afloat, thinking that it was just a glitch, not realizing like <laughs> the country went off the cliff. And so those conversations with uh, longstanding employees, that's, mm -hmm. it was very tough, man, to do that. And so um, I always use, my kids laugh if they would hear me say this now, but heavy is the head that wears the crown. So it's not yeah. always about, you know, it, it's, it's lovely we're making money. There are other aspects and facets of being an entrepreneur and a business owner mm -hmm. uh, that aren't pretty, that we have yep. to, we I mean, have to. When, you think, when you think about it, right, business is the business of people exactly right and so so there is no business without people and so like i think that's the hardest the, the most rewarding and the hardest thing to to always yeah wait right and work on and work through is like how do you communicate yeah. how do you keep people employed how do you keep people motivated like all those things are the hardest part the product to me is like yeah right. once it's created and you have a formula and you have a process for it, it's like okay the people are what are what are what the business is about especially in hospitality and like, that's the hardest and, and the most rewarding thing to like work with, you know? Well, let me, you mentioned product. Let me ask you about product real quick. Um, I teach, a, uh, a, I got a lot of online courses and I have uh, my latest course, my flagship course is called Brand Builder Academy Elite, where I teach people how to build e-commerce brands, uh, physical products brands. So when you came out with your physical products with, you know, Hella Cocktail, how did you know that it was going to be successful if you knew at all? And how did you do your research beside you and your buddies over there drinking and mixing? What type of, what type Fact, of right? That's how you do it. drink enough? Everything will taste good. <laughs> nah, but, nah, but, but how did you guys go about and say, all right, I think this is ready. And how did you introduce it uh, outside of your, your, um, ecosystem so to speak yeah no good question good question man I take you taking me back right now um i think a, a, a lot of initial because when you're dealing with um an unknown category that people don't really know about um 
and you're thinking about products that people don't know about the category and the product we did a lot of like experimentation okay we did a lot of experimentation with um the local uh what do you call them like accoutrement stores there were stores that we worked with that only sell things like chocolate Mm -hmm. flowers and bitters that's what they sold right and so we were tr- really trying to make a beeline to our end consumer by meeting them truly where they were and then asking them what they wanted and what they didn't want. Gotcha. Um, and so, we, like, I'm looking at one other thing right here. Mm-hmm. That's, that's an, um, that is an example of, like, what happens when you meet your customer and they give you that feedback okay. and you experiment. So these are the two first flavors that really go on any kind of, like, home bar or like cocktail bar which one am i trying to yeah, this one aromatic and orange they're kind of like the salt and pepper of the bar okay right and so we made these big bottles they're five ounce bottles at home they could last you like a year or two in the bar they might last you a month or two cool gotcha. so we made these but we put them in both retailers and bars and restaurants mm-hmm. one of our accounts was like man if you were able to put these two things in one box or one vessel you could sell a lot of it because this is a lot for a home consumer right. who wants to try it. He gave us this idea. Cool. Same two flavors, smaller bottles. How many package. ounces? These two are five ounces. These are 1.7 each. Makes sense. Right? So this is an example of us experimenting, but also listening to the customer in the same time, tell us what they wanted. So I'm just going to, I'm going to try to take out one okay. to see how, show you how small it is. Um, sure they're that small compared yeah. to the big bottle, nah. right? And so, and so, this was an example of just experimenting, right? Like smartly ex- experimenting about like what each type of consumer might want and right. value, right? And so, experimentation was key. We we didn't have like a, a a crystal ball that said this is what's working, but when we saw different different types of consumers, we realized that this was our retail SKU, mm-hmm. home run, and this was our bar SKU, gotcha. home run, right? So now we knew, okay, drive this one towards bar hospitality, drive mm-hmm. this one towards retail when we first started. And that's how we knew what was starting to work by experimenting. Cool, nah, that's great, man. Um, man, you dropping it right here, brother, I'm telling you, man. But this is, this is really, uh, and I'm glad we're getting in depth with this because you're really going deep into the actual uh, ascension of your business and how you guys are where you are right now. Uh, mm-hmm. In terms of retail, do you guys have any point of purchase displays? Say for those small ones, do you have any countertop displays? Do you have stand-up displays Good to help Good augment question. your sales? Great question, man. These are all great questions. So. This is a, you know, POS, point of sale displays, case stacks. And for those who don't know that lingo, that's the lang- language. That's the, uh, the stacks you see with the product in a nice, pretty, beautiful shelving that's branded uh, by the company that's selling you whatever product it is. We've always dabbled with the idea of it. For us, mm-hmm. we're always, let's call it Robin to Batman. Batman being the big spirit company. Right. It's really hard to get the space Mm-hmm. to have those uh, point of sale displays to make any sense for us. Gotcha. We'll always be next to a big brand's display. So we're gotcha. always on their display because mm-hmm. they're the big brand and they're trying to sell, the retailer trying to sell the recipe. Right. So okay. we, you know, while we thought about it for a long time, what we did in lieu of making the point of sale displays is if you look at the boxes behind you, mm-hmm. we made the boxes really beautiful. Right. So they can turn it to their own point of this, this point of sale display. Mm. So if you wanted to stack them up, they would start to look like this, right? And so you can stack them up and be beautiful and still have brand identity um, and still have something that looks cool. And so, you know, we're in the middle, the middle spot right now of whether or not we're going to build true, true traditional, uh, you know, point of sale material. Okay. Now that's great, man. And once again, that's something I'm sure that you learned after you got into the business and then said, you know what? Yes. Yeah. And, and one of the things too, um, that's those things are expensive, man. They're expensive. They, they throw them away right away. How yeah. they over garbage? You're like, what? That costs yep. 50 bucks. But, but speak to the importance of packaging for your sales. 
packaging is a lot, man. Packaging is a lot. Package packaging um is is one of those things that dictate people's perception of your brand. You know, it like can you repeat like, that? Can you repeat pack, that? I want everybody to get this. Pack, packaging, you know, dictate the perception of, of what your brand is to to people that have never seen you personally or heard you speak about your brand or mm-hmm. you know the the brand it, it, it communicates a lot about the brand identity. Um and so you know, you have to think about all kinds of things. When we first started the brand, uh, our older packaging, which was which was unique and incredible on its own, mm-hmm. you know, for, for all of its beauty, one of the key misses was that the font of the flavor was really small. Yeah. Right? So you had to, you know, we could all see, we were all young men, so we never thought about the fact that someone might not be able to see the <laughs> right. flavor. Right? And so we, we amped the flavor up. Like, you can't miss that. Right. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Telling. And so... So there were certain nuances that we figured out we need to improve on. So, you know, but, but the, but the, but the packaging and design means a lot to people, you know, they're going to put it in their house. They're going to open their refrigerator, open their cupboard mm-hmm. and want to be like, yeah, that that's a reflection of who I am. Right. And that's what packaging is. It's a reflection uh, of who people are. You know, the, some people have a simplistic point of view. They just want something that's clean. Right. Um, some people like really authentic antique looking stuff that looks old and that's cool too. So right. I think, you know, understanding your product and what identity you want it to have needs to live on the packaging. You know, for yeah. us, you mm-hmm. know, when you look at something like, like the Bloody Mary mix, like if you look really closely, we put the ingredients all over it, like the right. actual images of it. We want to evoke the ingredient story because we're so proud of what we put in the bottle. Exactly. We don't want to leave it up to, you know, imagination of what's in it. We want to show you like, oh, yeah, that's what's in the bottle. You don't have to be able to read to know what's in there. Man, yeah, that's important because I, I always tell people that your packaging needs to be aligned with your positioning. So if you're positioning your product as a high-end package, a uh, product packaging needs to be aligned. And I always use the example of if you buy Beats headphones. So if you buy Beats headphones, you, your opening experience is, is great. You got books in there, full color brochures and all that good stuff versus exactly. somebody that sells headphones in, in, in a clamshell. You're not going to get... <laughs> <laughs> three hundred dollars exactly. for headphones in a clamshell. So a lot of times, so, uh, exactly like an example of that is I showed you this package. Now, mm-hmm. not only does it come with the two flavors for the price of one, which is cool, but then on the back it has recipes that you can use it for. But then when you open it up, mm-hmm. and if you were to open it up and take this, take the, the the bottle out, behind it has recipes as well on the actual, you know, inside. And so, yeah. you know, you, you definitely want the packaging to speak volumes about. The, the product and what it does and how to use it, you know, and why it is, why it is, why it's premium, right? To your point about, about beats, why is it premium? Why is it worth more than, brother, you know, what you're probably used to? Man, I'm, I'm telling you, I think we might be related, bro. Uh, because I tell, <laughs> I tell my, my students all the time, you use packaging. So for example, so for my hot sauce, this is my three pack box, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I need, mine still. I need to get mine. Yeah, bro. I I'm going to send you some. So on the inside top flap, you got to use all of this space. And so, you know, thank you for your order, for your support. Tells you a little bit about the actual product. Hey, uh, we can't grow without your help. Send in a video of you using the hot sauce, get a discount, blah, blah. So being able to utilize packaging. So um, in order to, to move your brand forward, man, um, that's something that a lot of people don't think about. And then uh, I'm sure that packaging costs you a little bit more than normal packaging, but it pays off in the long run because you're positioned as a premium brand. Um, one it of wasn't my... always that way. You know, it wasn't always that way. We always thought about the packaging, but yeah. at the beginning, we couldn't afford that, this nice box. Exactly. We used to, we used to wrap it with a shrink wrap, which right. is a heat gun, <laughs> right? And we used to be right. like in a belly band, which is right, like right. a plastic wrap that you find at like the 99 cent store. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so like that was the first iteration of it. We knew we needed two of these to sit together, right. but we couldn't afford a box. Exactly. And so because people found the value proposition, they still bought it and allowed us to create the, the, the revenue to, to, to allow us to buy the box. Right. And so yep. you're always iterating on your packaging. You never stop doing that, you know? Yeah. So, man, so that's powerful because one of my other brands, my first brand that I hit it with is a, um, uh, a flat iron brand. So I have flat irons, hair serum, uh, thermal protector. You know, I'm a bald dude that, that sells flat irons, right? 
but it came from a story with my wife's flat iron broke, and that's how I got into that business and didn't realize the profit margins uh, in that business. But one of the things that I did was I had a high-end packaging. So my boxes were in uh, magnetic closure boxes, high-end packaging. So the, my landed costs from China with my, you know, my uh, trademark brand was $10.78 a unit. And I'm selling them for one hundred and twenty nine dollars. So oh, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah, so I got I got a lot of margin. <laughs> crazy <laughs> margin in there. But once again, it's based on how I position the brand as a high end brand, and it has to be aligned with the packaging and everything that goes along with it. And so, if you're not aligned in your product, you know, and your positioning, you're doomed from the start. So uh, yeah, man, that's uh, you speaking my language, bro. I'm telling you. <laughs> Everything like you, you said, talk, we might be related. I know. <laughs> Everything you're talking about, man, is uh, is is on point, man. Uh, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the success of your business, uh, you don't have to get specific, but uh, are you guys a seven figure business? Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. How long did it take you to break that seven figures? Um. So we got there in 2015. Okay. 2015 sounds right. So it probably took us like two hard years of going at it. Maybe two and a half hard years. Like the first, like I said, a few years were hobby, so it wasn't it wasn't line of sight. But when we put on the the thinking caps, like okay, turn it, make it real. Mm -hmm. it probably took us like two two and a half years. We were supposed to drink a um, you know, we got a <laughs> we got a a gift back in like I want to say 2013. We got a gift from a Johnny Walker, that was engraved blue bo blue label bottle. Oh wow! That had the company name on it. We were like, when we get our first million, we're drinking this bottle. Mm -hmm. That bottle's still in my house, unopened. And we're like, nah, yeah. not yet, <laughs> <laughs> not yet. I hear you. What you waiting for? Fifty million? I don't know. I don't. Well, I don't even know what we're waiting for. It's just well, there. It's like, <laughs> it's like it's not there yet. I don't know what it is. I guess we'll know when it hits. You know, when it hits. Um, only got a couple questions. More questions. I'm not gonna hold you too long, bro. Okay. Um. In terms of exit strategy, do you have one? I know in your space, you build up a brand, um, you know, a valuable brand. A lot of times people will come after you. It's easier to, to take over a brand than to start it, obviously, from scratch. So what's your exit strategy if you have one? Do you plan Good on selling question. eventually? Or? Good question. I mean, I think, I think overall, there's always a number, right? Gotcha. You're just being real with yourself. There's always a number. Mm -hmm. I think what we're building right now has been a um, – a project of passion and like of opportunity, meaning we all want the opportunity to be wanted, but mm -hmm. the opportunity to just keep going. Right. Right. It's almost like if you think about the space we're in, most of the companies, you know, in our space, in our tangential space are hundreds of years old. Right. Right. Just name a brand, Jack Daniels, Johnny Walker, whatever, name a brand. They're, they're, those, the founders are long gone. The family's like, you know, yeah have benefited from that, that, that hard work, um, for generations. Right. So I think, you know, for us, it's about the opportunity to create that space or to say, you know what, we want to do something else. And so the exit strategy is like about time and about, um, the opportunity to, to, to have that, to have that option, really we're creating an option, right? If you think right. about the stock market and stuff like that, we're creating an option. An option. So yeah. while we're, while we're enjoying the journey and creating amazing products and having a good time doing it, we're also trying to create the option. Yeah, options are good. Uh, <laughs> you got to have options. Um, let me ask you, did all three of you guys come out at the same time to go full-time or were you staggered? Oh, we staggered. We, that's a great question. No, we staggered. Okay. Two of us came full-time okay. at the same time and the third came a, two years later. So that's, okay. that was a testament to us, again, um, thinking to ourselves, what was the true runway for a third partner to get a full-time salary versus right. investing that that gap into the business over and over so it took us a year and a half or okay. two years to say okay we can afford to make that make sense and be sustainable with it gotcha so when you guys first uh you and your other partner that first stepped out uh initially were you pulling salaries as soon as you stepped out 
on your, you know, very things. modestly. So we, we we were both still working jobs. Okay. And like so, like Tobin was a was a is a, a decade long, you know, um, New York City hospitality veteran. And so at that time, he was working um, his full time job at Fedora Bar mm -hmm. from I think they shift at four to two a.m. Then he would go to sleep, get up at ten, and then come to the office and meet me where I where I would be. Gotcha. So we were still grinding and taking a small salary because we weren't able to take, right? You know, full full wages at that time. So we were still, you know, bootstrapping it, you know, all the yeah. way. And only only until a few years ago can we say, you know, we truly, you know, are not are not, you know, yeah. bootstrapping in in that same way, you know. Yeah. It takes a minute. That's what's up. So you putting in that work, man. I, I want people work. to realize that it doesn't happen overnight. You got to put the work in. So. Um, two more quick questions. Um, in terms of the actual impetus to go out on, you know, not on your own, but when you made that transition from corporate America to, to full time in your business, what was that conversation like? And what was it predicated on? Was it predicated on that you knew you couldn't build this business without a full time effort? Or was it predicated on, okay, I can make enough salary where I can go in here and mix around and we can see what happens. What was your, your the impetus to? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, for me, for me personally, it's always been about um, creating curiosity gaps and in just in, in, in the, in the, in the world and then yeah. filling them. Right. And like, like having that autonomy to say, I'm curious about this and I want to explore it. Can I do that like on my own or not? Right. And so the, the, the conversation for me has always been about that times, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. When I was a little kid, I used to count pennies, right? I used right. to like, I'd look at the, open a post and my dad would bring it home and like figure out the stock market and look through the things. But like, how do people make, how are people doing this? They're doing right. something, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's always been about this curiosity, this curious space that I wanted to like uncover and figure out and see how things work and then build something. That how, yeah. how, you know, once you understand how things work, it's like, why, why can I build that? Right. Why do I have to go work for someone who's building it and I'm helping them build it? Which is not bad, right? We need we need everybody to be part of some part of the system. But right. I was I was always that curious person. So the conversation for me was always was always in my mind, even when I was doing corporate. I was like, let me learn skills, but this is not where I'm not letting someone else dictate my ceiling. I'm right. not letting someone else dictate the potential that I have because mm -hmm. that's dependent on what they see, right? So we're not going to do that. That ain't going to work. Right. Uh, so I was always in conflict with anyone who was above me telling me what I should and cannot do. And so I always knew when I was when I was a teenager working at Model Sporting Goods that this wasn't oh, gonna wow. be space. Yeah. Um and so I was always trying to figure out how to create that freedom for myself by uh, but but something that allowed me to be authentic um and like still sit on my values and principles without compromising them. Right. And so yeah. like how do you what space is that and where does it exist? Right. And so the opportunity to work with my buddies was out of a was out of a hobby, right? So it wasn't right. it wasn't a predestined like, okay, here's the plan. Here's how I'm gonna get, here's how I'm gonna get from A to B. It was right. like, this is cool. This is interesting. Um, let's see what where it goes. And so for me, again, maybe a little bit more luckily that it happened in such an organic way that wasn't right. forced. Gotcha. Um, so for me, the only thing that I've always thought about in terms of like businesses versus like not being an entrepreneur was do I want to be in a business that cre that provides a service or a business that provides a unit? Right. One is much more scalable than the other for me, yeah. from my perspective. Yeah. And so I knew that I always wanted a business that provided units mm -hmm. because I could potentially build brand and then, you know, it would scale on its own with inertia behind it, but not if, if my hour wasn't, I wasn't working that hour, I could still, right. I could still make money. Right. And so the right. question for me was really like, how can I, find and create a unit based business that can do that. Nah, that makes a lot of sense, man. Uh, last second to last question, man. Um, before you give all your, your information on your company, you know, links and all that good stuff. Um, is there anything that I forgot to ask you or that you want to impart to the black entrepreneur blueprint family? Um, before I ask you this last question. Sometimes I want to make sure that yeah. I've gotten everything. And, but if there's something that we left out that you feel that the BEB family uh, um, should know, um, please let the, me. The only, the only things that, that, that are on my mind of note, you know, um, are, are, you know, one, Black Lives Matter, and they always have. Mm -hmm. Two, 
um, live richly, meaning pay it forward, right? Like, like, like I'm not a rich man in terms of wealth and dollars, but I am a rich man in terms of knowledge and self. And yeah. so pay that forward is what I'd encourage everyone to do. Pay whatever you have forward, you know, and so Definitely. live richly that way. Um, but yeah, those are my, those are my two, two thoughts that I think, you okay. know, just we need appreciate to be out there. that. Um, all right, man. How can people purchase your products, get up with your company? Because uh, what we do, we have a very responsive audience here at Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. And the BEB family knows anybody that I bring on the platform, they're solid, good business people, and we definitely want to support you. So how can we find out about Helicopter? Yeah, for sure. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, there are a bunch of ways. I'll give you a few real quick. I'll rattle them off. All right. The first one is if you want to pick up some Hella, uh, go to our website, hellacocktail.co, um, and use the code the Black Man Can oh, cool. uh, for fifteen percent off anything in your shopping cart. That's one way. Okay. Uh, the second way is to uh, just follow us on the gram. Do simple stuff. We're at Hella Cocktail Co on the gram. Okay. Um, if you want to see and learn more recipes and just learn about what we do, everything we do is not all cocktail based. We do things that are paying again, paying it forward. Whether it's Me Too or BLM, we're okay. active in those spaces. So. You can, you know, if you want to identify with a brand that's built on your values and your set of beliefs, like holla at us. Um, and then third, if you want to pick us up in your local retail store, uh, you can find us in your local Total Wine and More, your local Harris Teeter, your local Whole Foods, et cetera, et cetera. There's a list of those stores on the website too. So um, we love, we love to have you support your voice, your thoughts. Get at us. Cool. Um, all right, man, you, you, you made me bring up one more question before I ask the last okay. one. <laughs> so, so in today's climate, right, with, with everything that's going on politically, socially, um, you got, you know, obviously Black Lives Matter, then you got, you know, uh, opposing forces out there. Um, in being a Black-owned business, or do you, how do you navigate that? Do you, are you out front, I'm a Black-owned business, or are you hey, this is my business and we just happen to be black. How, how does that, what does that look like? That's a good question, man. So, so just for the record, we're a black led minority owned company. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but with that said, uh, we, don't, we don't hold any strings, right? Like, like the company and any company is only, if it's authentic, it's only a representation of its people, right? right? And so whether that is means for us, you know, you know, we support like one of our, one of our colleagues, like leads a Parkinson's disease runner. We sponsor that, mm -hmm. right? One of our colleagues, you know, like, like whatever the thing is that bleeds out of you is what we're about. So there's, there's no, there's no, there's no like carving out, like we only do this and we only do that. We do what our company and the people of the company represent. Career is full stop. Um, excuse me, hold on. Yep, no problem. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Um, you still got a fax machine, man. <laughs> nah, this is an old school, uh, old school, I don't even know how to, put it like this, I don't even know how to turn it off. Um, <laughs> so how long I haven't answered that for, I don't even know how to turn it off. Oh, that was um, old school, it's old school. <laughs> the landline, it's the landline. I it's thought just, it was a fax machine or something. Man. The landline. <laughs> um, so, so we are, you know, so we lean in, we lean into everything. There's no holes barred there. We don't, we don't, you know, if you look at our, if you look at our gram right now, um, you'll see that we do this program called On the Menu Now, which is all about um, promoting Black businesses with, you know, promoting the Black business narrative. Right. And what we do there is we, you know, have Black-owned businesses talk with white and ally-owned businesses. It's about amplification of narrative, right? And so we're not, we, we are where our consumers are, but we are as individuals in the, in the company and where our consumers are, right? And we don't feel like we need to serve every customer because they might not vibe with our values and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we are going to, we, we will not stop being ourselves and kind of leaning into our natural spaces, right? Our natural personal spaces. And so that's what the company is about. And so whether or not that's like Black Lives Matter or Hispanic Heritage Month or whatever it is that we are right. actually part of the company, that, that's what we lean into in that moment. Cool. Being, being authentic. I appreciate that. Um, last question, bro. If you had the opportunity to have a conversation with one person, living or dead, who would it be and why? <laughs> who would that be? <clears throat> Man. Holy moly. It'd probably be somebody like Michelle Obama. 
at this point. She gotcha. encompasses so many different like facets that I mm-hmm. that I admire um, from the black female point of view. You know, it's like I would I would probably said Obama, but I get the male POV. Like I could understand, mm-hmm. you know, his struggle, his, his where he came from, how he got there. I could see, I could I could visualize that. But from Michelle, I'm like, I want to I would love to learn more about that plight, right? Because I think right. the the black female is probably the most underrepresented in a lot of spaces. And it's like how do you, and I, and I have, and I have two daughters, right? So I'm like, how do you exactly. solve that down um, in a day-to-day basis? My mom is a great example. So I understand it in a lot of ways, but like at that level, right? Yeah. At that level, it's like, how do you keep that consistent with, with all the things that probably are against you in the, in the world and the people who are against you and thoughts that are against you? How do you always go high, you know? Yeah. Nah, that's a good answer, man. Brother Jamari, I appreciate you, man, for sharing your time and expertise and dropping all types of gems on the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, brother. Uh, we got to get you back on, man. When, once you crack that 50 million barrier, wherever your <laughs> next barrier is, we got, we got to get you back on, man. Anytime you have any new products or anything or developments, uh, hit me up. I'm sure we're going to be in contact anyway outside of this. And, uh, man, we appreciate you for sharing, man. And we, we really love your story and what i really appreciate about you man i interview a lot of people uh very succinct uh very thought out uh answers and i know the bev family is going to really appreciate it when this drops man i appreciate you jay jones thank you brother that was an amazing interview with mr jomari pinkard co-founder of hella cocktail make sure you guys support hella cocktail you know how we do it here at the bev family we show love for everybody that's on the show Now, before I do the quick takeaways from today's episode, I just want to share my social media contact information and my resource links. I'm going to start off with my resource links. First and foremost, at the top of the show, I mentioned my new book out, A New Black Wall Street, Circulating the Black Dollar Worldwide by Building Successful E-Commerce Businesses. Just go to anewblackwallstreet.com. Pick yourself up a copy. Print version, $14.95. Digital version is $9.95. Also, I mentioned at the top of the show, two of my platforms that I created to help circulate dollars in the worldwide black economy, BeSmartBuyBlack.com and HireBlackFreelancers.com. If you are a black product producer and you want to sell your products to black consumers worldwide, especially in Q4 family, the holiday season, upload your product information to BeSmartBuyBlack.com. It is free and you can sell your products to black consumers worldwide. Once again, it's free to upload your product information. Also, for any freelancers out there, if you're on freelancer.com or fiverr.com, same thing, upload your contact information to hireblackfreelancers.com. It is free, so you can connect and do business with black consumers and black businesses that wanna hire black freelancers. Also, I mentioned at the top of the show, my new rebranded, rebooted Black Entrepreneur Blueprint Academy. This is an online learning portal to help you elevate your entrepreneur IQ. Now, we currently have multiple courses behind the academy, also trainings, and we're going to have something new at least every two weeks. I mentioned at the top of the show, we have a new training called How to Use Quizzes to Sell Your Product or Services, How to Build a Successful YouTube Channel, LinkedIn success, how to leverage LinkedIn to get more sales, plus an additional plethora of other courses, e-commerce courses, financial courses, all types of things back there. We're going to have master classes and we're also going to have teachers that come in and teach their expertise. All of that is behind Black Entrepreneur Blueprint Academy. Go to BEBacademy.com. You can get a five day free trial and access everything behind the academy. After your five-day free trial, you'll be billed $29 a month, and that includes all of the content, which is going to be continually updated. You'll have a community where you can talk to and interact with other people in the academy, and we also are going to meet for a live group session once a month. So this is what a good online learning component needs, family. You need the curriculum, which is there. You need the community, which you have. And you also need the coaching. So make sure you go to BEBacademy.com. Once again, get five days free. After that, you'll be billed each month $29. It's no obligation. You can stay as long as you want or as short as you want. 
But once again, it's about elevating your entrepreneur IQ. If you're not going forward and continuing to learn, you're not standing still, family. You're going backwards. Also, if you're interested in building a successful, sustainable e-commerce business, my flagship course, Brand Builder Academy Elite, is available for you right now. It is only $97 with the coupon code BBA Elite 100. Now, you can go to BBAElite.com. Check out the program. It is a 15-week intensive interactive learning program that helps you to build your e-commerce business. It could be a physical products brand business or a digital products brand business. Make sure you go to BBAElite.com. Use the coupon code BBAElite100. It is only $97. Pound for pound, I'm telling you in terms of individual courses, this is it. Now, the course is not in the BEB Academy because it is a flagship program. I know that was a mouthful, but if you go to BEBConnect.com, you will see all of those links. BEBConnect.com, it takes you to a page on my website. Now, all my social media contact information, real quick. If you want to connect with me and have something long, just hit me on my email, jjones at blackentrepreneurblueprint.com, J-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S at blackentrepreneurblueprint.com. Facebook, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Twitter, jjones001, J A Y. J-O-N-E-S-001. Instagram, J Jones for real. J-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S, the number four, R-E-A-L. YouTube, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, family. I have additional content on YouTube that is not on the show. Yes, the show does come out on YouTube, and you can watch this interview live today, but just go to YouTube, type in Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, and hit the subscribe button. Also, LinkedIn, check me out on LinkedIn, J Jones, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Also, if you want to be included in the BEB text line for special notifications and reminders, text BEB to 555-888, BEB to 555-888. Let's get to the takeaways from today's episode. Once again, guys, all of that information is at BEBConnect.com. You'll have links to all of the information that I just gave you. Now, let's start talking about some of these takeaways with my man Jamari Pinkert from Hella Cocktail. First thing that I really like that he said, and this is toward the end of the interview, he said he was interested in building units versus building a service-based business so he'll be able to scale. Building units versus a service-based business so he'll be able to scale. So many times, family, when we have service-based businesses, we can only service people for a finite finite amount of time. So we got 24 hours in a day and obviously you're not gonna be working 24 hours. So it's gonna be harder to scale a service business unless you bring on additional employees. Now, if you have a product-based business and you sell units, all you have to do to scale that business is increase the unit sales and add more products or more variations. So now you're increasing the number of products that you can sell which in turn will increase the number of units. One of the other things that really uh, stuck out to me was uh, sometimes we always think that we have to be or create a product that is the main product. But what you saw with Jamari, they created a complementary product for the spirits industry. So start thinking about complementary products. Sometimes we don't have to have the main product to make money. We can use a complementary product. So it's bitters, sodas, mixers, and anything non-alcoholic that focuses on the spirits industry is where he's playing. And that's the space right now that's huge and is never going to go away, family. So that's an industry. The spirits industry, the liquor industry is never going away. So they are in a great place. Another thing that I like that uh, Jamari spoke about was when he talked about bootstrapping the business. So they didn't start this business with a whole lot of money. And I know a lot of times people think that they have to have, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Now, it does depend on what type of business you're starting, but you can always learn to bootstrap. And one of the things that I learned about bootstrapping was that when you're bootstrapping, you're going to be very critical about how you spend the money that you do have, as opposed to having tons of money through maybe a a capital raise. And now you're blowing money fast. Right. You're just blowing money on stuff and you don't really have to sit down and analyze, you know, what's the return on investment because you have a stack of money sitting there that you can make mistakes with. 
So being able to build your business by bootstrapping is critical if you don't have the money. In, in, a, in a grand scheme of things, you would love to have all the capital you needed. But let's be real, guys. Most of us business owners, when we start out, don't have that capital. And even the amount of capital that you estimate, you probably pretty much got to double that. Because there's so many things that come up that you're not privy to until you get into the business and start mixing around. And now you find out, oh, man, I got to do this, this. I didn't know I needed that. So even your estimates a lot of times are going to be lower than what you actually need. So being able to bootstrap and being able to reinvest the monies that you earn as opposed to pulling it out to live. Those are things and tactics that can help you bootstrap. But everybody's situation is different. So I, I definitely get it. Uh, before we close on our family, I say this each and every week, and I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Um, this isn't possible without the BEV family. We're getting more and more downloads each and every week, and that's because of you, the BEB family. Please continue to spread the word about the podcast, the YouTube channel, the blog, about the whole movement, because that's really what it is, family. We're trying to build an economic power base in the black community. You know, we got an election that's going on. And as of this recording, I don't even know. We don't even know who won yet. We have social unrest. Uh, I mean, it's, there's, there's hate going on. There's division within the country. And we need to be self-sufficient. So there's no revolution without economics. And the way we become self-sufficient is by creating, building, and supporting black-owned businesses. Where we don't have to go anywhere else to get what we need. Once again, that's why I created those two platforms, BeSmartBuyBlack.com, Hire Black Freelancers. Look, it's Q4, family. People are going to be shopping, spending money they have and spending money they don't have. But what I'm saying is be intentional. Go on those sites. Go on those platforms. Go directly to the, the black business owners' uh, websites. Start being intentional and spending money with black-owned businesses, okay? Make it a process that you do. All right, you're spending money on Amazon, right? So everybody shopping online, go seek out a black owned business and start spending your money with people that, that look like you, that care about you and that love you, okay? Once again, family, there's no revolution without economics. Love you guys. See you same time next week. Peace.